Hey everybody, today's service is starting in one minute. And today we finish off our series on the Lord's Prayer with a teaching titled, The Existence of Evil. So let's find our seats, turn our phones on silent, and let's get ready to worship our Lord. Everybody, and welcome to this morning's worship experience. My name is Alyssa and I'm so excited you're joining us today. If you're following us on Facebook, I do want to encourage you to please comment down below or hit that like button to let us know you're here. And if you're joining us in person for the first time, please fill out one of those connect cards which you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you. For tithes and offerings, you can send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or you can place your tithes and offerings in the boxes located here in the sanctuary. Happening next Friday at 7 p.m., join us for Bowling at Bronx Bowl. It is $20 per person and this event is open to everyone of all ages. If you are interested in coming, please make sure you talk to Tanya Fedora so that we can have enough lanes booked for this group. But we do hope that you'll join us once again next Friday at 7 p.m. at Bronx Bowl. Everyone's welcome and we cannot wait to see you. Happening on Friday, December 13th, we're going to be having our annual pot Christmas potluck and gift exchange. So this is going to start at 6 p.m. Bring your favorite dish to share. And if you would like to participate in the gift exchange, you just need to bring a gift valued no more than $10. For all, their, all other information, please talk to Tanya Fedora. And then join us on Christmas Eve for our candlelight service. You do not want to miss this as we sing carols, as we tell the Christmas story, and as we do it under the beautiful glow of candlelight. So join us once again on December 24th at 6.30 p.m. Bring your family, bring your friends. This is open to everyone. And once again, we cannot wait to see you. Lastly, if you haven't noticed already, we have started collecting things for our mitten tree as well as our Christmas food hampers. You can start bringing in mittens, hats, and socks and help decorate our tree and all of those items will be donated to those who need it most this winter season. Also, if you would like to help us out by blessing some families this Christmas, you can grab yourself an ornament from our food hamper tree, collect that item, bring it back. All donations need to be back by December 15th. For all information, for events, for things happening here in the church, please follow us on Facebook and check out our website, which is vantagepointcc.org. And if you're joining us in person, get yourself a bulletin. Now, let's get this service started. Good morning. Good morning. Well, why don't you stand with us? We'll start with some worship. What mercy was revealed, what selflessness and peace, my faith was surely sealed, until He rescued me. His pardon for my sin, His bounty for my need, from slavery and shame, I am redeemed. Fear can hold me down No darkness 
And when the sea is raging, your spirit is my help. He'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll say that it is well. For thee, 
that I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me again? As I walk down through the valley Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me again? Cause all I want is all.
unless you come, you make me ill, yeah. Cause all I want is all you All you brave ones. Well, I don't want you to be surprised. So in case you didn't notice, it snowed. It looks a lot like Christmas out there, which we're getting closer, so that's okay. But just like I said, just didn't want you to be surprised when you walked out and find out that it's, you know, there's a foot of snow out there, in case you missed it on the way in. We have been in a series we're calling the Lord's Prayer about the Lord's Prayer. And I have to admit, this week I've been thinking a lot about evil and what that really means. And if you've talked to me this week, you might recognize that that was kind of on my, on my mind because we probably talked a little bit about evil. And sometimes I wonder if we don't get it wrong or maybe I don't know so have you ever noticed that we often seem to think that someone who disagrees with us is evil you know or maybe it's Canada Post for being on strike or something just wanted to make sure Richard was awake But, you know, the politicians that we don't agree with, they're, they're often evil. Are they really? Or do they just, just disagree with us a little bit? Of course, on the flip side, there are some guys that maybe were 
evil, right? That's E.D. Amin. One of the most brutal dictators that this world has ever known. Would he qualify as evil? What about, we, we talked last week about the Rwanda genocide, this whole idea of trying to wipe a people off the face of the earth. Does that qualify as, as evil? What about that dude? Is he evil? I think sometimes we need to kind of settle down and try to figure out what it is that is evil and what it is is just disagreement. And I've admitted that there is, there's people who do not like me. I know that's really hard for me to get my head around, but there are people who disagree with me on some things. And am I evil because of that? Or are they evil because of that? I don't know. It's the conversation we have. It's, it's, the, it's that thing that seems to come up in conversation. I am probably at best described politically as a fiscal conservative, which basically, partially at least, means that I don't believe in debt. Um, I think personal debt is bad. I think public debt is bad. Either way, I, I just don't like debt. I, I, I can almost weep when I look at you know, our national debt and look at the amount of money that we are having to pay to service that debt. And think of all the good things we could do if we weren't in debt, if we didn't have to pay that to the bank. There are some things that we could do. So I know that there are people that, that disagree with me. And I've talked to politicians. I talked to one a couple of years ago, and he said, hey, Gary, you just have to understand. Yes, we are going to borrow some money early. So the first four years of our term, we're going to borrow a little bit of money so we can make everything go. And then we'll start paying it back. Or I think he said actually 10 years down the road we'll start paying it back. But that government didn't last that long. And so the next people come in, <coughs> once again, they want to borrow some more money. And I found that politicians are really good at borrowing money, not so good at paying it back. You may disagree with me. You may think debt is a wonderful thing, that it keeps our economy going, that you know, this, is, this is good, and we would have a disagreement over that. But does that mean that one of us is evil and one of us isn't? I, I ask because we seem to have these conversations within our culture right now. The other side is always the worst. They're evil. They have to be dealt with. They should be thrown in jail or worse. On the flip side of this coin, there is this idea that we are all, at least a little, evil. So, Paul writes this. There is no one righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. We're, we're all evil because we've all fallen short of what God wanted for us. Jesus said this, be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And again, when we talk about yeast, we are talking about sin. That is the code the Bible uses for sin because yeast works its way throughout the bread. It, it, it makes its way throughout the dough. You mix it in. And it affects all of it. And the image is that we 
is that yeast is like that in our lives. It, a small amount comes into us, and it works through all that we are. Again, going back to Paul, he says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If we went back into the law, um, we have this idea of a grain offering. And, and there are several ways you could bring a grain offering according to the Torah. One of them is you can just bring the grain in and, that, and, and offer that, and that is wholly acceptable. But you can also offer the grain in something that is cooked. So we've got a, a baking sale back here. Um, after, after church, you can go and, and take a look. It's all the stuff left over from yesterday's sale over at the community center. But the idea is, is that if you want to bring your, your grain offering in for sacrifice, you would cook it at home because righteousness starts at home, but you would not use yeast. So you would cook this unleavened whatever it is at home and you could bring it into the temple and you could offer that as your sacrifice, as your grain offering before God. But you didn't use yeast or leaven because that would be sin. That's the image the Bible holds for sin. So there's a little yeast in all of us. We are looking at the Lord's Prayer, so let's pray it again one, one more time. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we're just going to look at that one verse, Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that first blank is just simply the test. Have you ever done anything wrong? No, nobody has, okay. It's good to be talking to a whole bunch of saints. Um, Do you know when you're doing something wrong? Sometimes? You do something and you you go, you know, I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't what I was supposed to do. And if you're like me, you kind of get down and say, okay, God, that was wrong, and I recognize that was wrong, and I just ask that you would forgive me and he does did you know that knowing that you're doing something wrong is actually a blessing and sometimes we don't even get that right I was listening about well it was actually at the end of October I was listening to a podcast And uh, it was a history podcast. That's what I listened to a lot of. And they were talking about, again, we were going back to this guy. They went back to this guy, and they started talking about him. And, And the one historian asked the other a question that I had never really considered. He asked this. Did Hitler know that what he was doing was wrong? Did he know that what was happening was evil. And then they went on. Okay, so if Hitler knew, did his lieutenants know? What about prominent citizens? What about the average guy on the street? Did they know that they were going to be seen as evil by historians 50 years down the road? Did they understand that? 
Or is this something totally, that totally went by them and they didn't realize it? And one of the test cases for whether or not they thought what they were doing was wrong is probably this guy. His name is Albert Eichmann. And he was one of the authors of The Final Solution. He was actually in charge of logistics for getting the Jews and the enemies of the state to the various prisons or concentration camps or death camps. That was his job. So he was the one who sent people to, basically, to the, to the ovens, to the gas chambers. So as, as Nazi Germany was falling, he, well, he was actually arrested. And then somehow, I'm not sure on the details here, he was arrested and then he escaped, and he went to Argentina. And so he... He, he lived down in Argentina until about 1960 when Mossad came, found him, arrested him, and brought him back to Israel to be tried. And so in 1960, 1961, they had a trial of Albert Eichmann. They listed all of the things that he was being charged with, all of the things that he did. Now, you need to understand this is not a monster. He had a very average bringing up. He was brought up in a Calvinistic Christian church. His parents were Christians. Um, there's no indication that he was abused in any way. He was just kind of, you know, that average Christian guy. And so as he's tried and he's found guilty and then he is sentenced to be hung, which would happen in, in 1962. But all the way through this process, not once did Albert Eichmann, this average guy, admit that what he had done was wrong. There didn't seem to be any guilt inside of him. It's like what he did was normal. It was what needed to be done. That's why I say, you know, sometimes when we do something wrong and we know it's wrong, that's a good thing. Because there are some people that, that don't feel that way. So, we are tested. We are tested and part of our growth actually comes in our response to the test or our response to the temptation. In the prayer, it says, deliver us from the evil one, but it also says, you know, do not, do not lead us into temptation. Actually, the Bible is very clear that God does not tempt us. Listen to this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. We set the seed of evil inside of us by our desires, by what we want, and then it grows into something that we don't want. Paul writes this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is, we misquote this verse. We say, God will never give me more than I can handle. That's not what it says. It never says that God won't give me more than I can handle. It says that God will not allow us to be tempted or tested beyond the point where we can say no. Temptation meets us. We have the ability to say no. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we make excuses for what we want to do because we want to do it. You know, Paul said, why in the world do I, you know, do the things that I know are wrong and I don't do the things that I, that I know are right? 
Well, that's common to all of us. We all have this thing inside of us that is like that. So there's nothing new about that. But we need to realize that God has promised there will be a way out of temptation whenever it, it comes to us. And the next blank is deliver us from both evil and the evil one. So if you learned this wonderful prayer in the King James Version, you probably remember that it wasn't the evil one. It was deliver us from evil, not the evil one. NIV, some of the modern translations say evil one. So the question, the obvious question is, so which is true? Which one's the right, the right um, translation? Ready for the answer? Yes. They both are. The word that is used for evil or evil one means both of those things. It means evil. It also means the evil one. So it can be used both ways. Both are appropriate. Both are right. Um, I love this guy. His name's C.S. Lewis. And he makes a wonderful argument about Satan. He says that we make two mistakes when we're dealing with the devil. The first mistake is this. We put him in a red suit and dance him around, and he looks so ridiculous that nobody can believe, believe in him. The second mistake that we make is that we think he's hiding under every rock and behind every tree. And he says both of those are errors. He is not something that looks foolish. He's also not hiding behind every tree under every rock. In fact, the mistake that we make here is that we think that Satan is omnipresent, like God. God is here. We know that God is here. He has promised that where two or three are gathered, he would be here in our midst. We, we understand that he's here. I don't know if Satan is here. And if he is, he is absolutely nowhere else because he can only be in one place at once. That does not mean that his minions are not here and they're not trying to cause some havoc in this place. I think they are. But as far as the devil, he is tied to one place and one time. So, we often think that Satan is the opposite of God. God is good, Satan is evil. But that's not quite right. If you want to know what's the opposite of, of the devil or Satan, a better choice might be the archangel Michael. Michael is the opposite of Satan. They're both angels. But Satan's not an, an, an omnipotent being. And so, we get tempted. And then we often like, you know, we often respond like Flip Wilson, right? That's my favorite. One, one of my favorite 70s comedians. You know, there's, there's Flip and there's his alter eagle, Gerald, Geraldine Jones. And you don't remember what Geraldine always said. The devil made me do it. Yeah, no. The devil can't make you do anything. Any evil we do is because we have chosen to do it. The Bible says that if you sin unintentionally, even then you need to bring a sacrifice, or for us it would be ask for forgiveness for your sin. Even if you didn't mean to sin, you're still accountable for it. So the devil didn't make me do it. It's built on bad theology that believes that, number one, Satan can make us do things. And number two, that Satan, again, is omnipotent, and he is not. He is not. So we have this idea that evil comes from maybe Satan or his minions. 
And we ask that God would not lead us into temptation. We also ask, and maybe a better way of looking at this would be to deliver us from evil and the evil one. So don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil and the evil one, and God will do that. He will deliver us when we need to be delivered. That next blank, a working definition of good and evil. I don't know whether you caught the news this week, but Tony Campolo passed away at the age of 89. Sad day for people like me who really like Tony. Um, You've heard me probably tell the story, but back when I was just starting out, I was an associate pastor, and I was working at a church, and the pastor one day came up and asked me something. He said, who is your favorite preacher? Looking back, I should have probably said him, but I didn't. For one thing, having a favorite preacher, <clears throat> having a favorite preacher for me was kind of like saying, what's your favorite vegetable? I don't like vegetables. I really don't have a favorite vegetable. So he asked me, what's my favorite preacher? And I'm, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out what I, how I can answer it. And I don't have an answer for him. Today, I think I'd have a few answers, but I was younger then. And so finally, I came up with Tony Campolo. I said, Tony Campolo is my favorite preacher. And my boss, he's a sociologist, not a preacher. Okay, sorry, got got that one wrong. You still let me work for him. Uh, But Tony, I just simply liked the way that he spoke and talked about things. I was reading one article this week on his death, and, and, and it made the comment that Tony liked to make us, the church being us, uncomfortable. That seemed to be his superpower. He made us feel just a little uncomfortable. I'm going to do something in a minute that I don't normally do, so I'm going to warn you. Probably would work better if I didn't warn you, but I'm going to warn you. As, they, as the Southerners would say, I'm going to cuss or curse or whatever you want to say it. So just recognize that it's coming. It just works better if I do it than if I don't, talking about Tony. So one of Tony's favorite, uh, favorite quotes that I think a lot of preachers have used, and if they... <laughs> they've probably used it. Many of them have used it without saying it came from Tony Campolo. It was just one of those things. But Tony would often get up to, in his speaking engagement, and the first thing he would say, he would tell you how many kids died the day before. It was just one of his things. So one one time, probably did it a lot more than just once. He got up in front of a, a Christian audience and said, I want to give you three truths. So this is where the cussing is coming in. Just, again, if you don't want to hear me cuss, you can go to the bathroom right now. Something, okay? He said, I want to, I want to tell you three truths. Truth number one, 30,000 kids died last night from starvation or malnutrition-related diseases. 30,000 kids. Number two. Most of you, and here's where the cussing comes in, most of you don't give a shit about truth number one. And the third truth, most of you are more concerned that I said the word shit than 30,000 children died last night. And he's probably right. For Tony, that was an unacceptable situation. Another thing he liked to say was that you know, this goes back to the what would Jesus do or 
the subsequent what would Jesus drive conversations that we had back in the day. And he'd say, if Jesus had $40,000 and kids were starving, and kids were starving, children were starving, what kind of car would Jesus buy? Like I said, he liked to make us feel just a little uncomfortable. Tony had a favorite verse. What he thought was the pinnacle of the Bible. I have a passage that I believe is the pinnacle of the Bible, and we're actually studying part of it in the last few weeks, the Lord's Prayer. It's all from Matthew 5 to 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And for me, that is the highest point of the Bible. Tony, if he was here this morning, would disagree with me. He'd probably say you got the gospel right, but not the passage. In memory of Tony this morning, I want to read his favorite passage. You've heard it before. It's a little bit long, but will you give me the opportunity to just simply read what Tony Campolo thought was the height of the Bible? Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They, will also, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will re- reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then, then he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Pinnacle of the gospel, the ministry to the least of these. I've got one more quote. I'll tell you who said it in just a second. But keeping Matthew 25 in your mind, listen to this. We do not start from the individual. We do not believe that the starving should be fed, that the thirsty should be given to drink, 
or that the naked should be clothed. These are not valuable, valuable motives in our eyes. Our motives are of an entirely different nature. They may be summed up in a lapidary manner. We must have healthy people to dominate in the world. Any idea who said it? Joseph Goebbels in 1938, one of the closed aides of Adolf Hitler. said we're looking for a working definition of good and evil. And maybe it just simply comes down to this. God is good. And you reply? Go ahead. Start trying to get. God is good all the time. And all the time, that says two different things. It's not just that he acts as if he's good. He is good. Which means that everything he teaches us is good. And whatever the opposite is of what Jesus teaches us is evil. I know, that's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? So, if Jesus was to look at what Mr. Goebbels wrote, he might make these corrections. We start from the individual. We believe that the starving should be fed, that the thirsty should be given drink, and that the naked should be clothed. We are concerned about the least of these. If you want to combat evil, one of the best ways is to allow God to guide you in things and ways of doing good. Of fulfilling Matthew 25. As I was sitting, working on this on this message, I was kind of thinking, you know, what are the things here at Vantage Point that we can be involved in that would help us get to there? That would help us make sure that we are doing things that are good. Obviously, supporting the church is, is one thing because that's what we're, we're trying to do. But there are some, some specific ministries where you can be involved and you can help us do good. The first one, Christmas hampers. We give away a few Christmas hampers every year to people within our congregation that just need a little help. There's nothing like just saying, you know what, there's a tree out there, you can take something off of it, go purchase it, bring the purchased item and the felt thing that you took off the tree and just donate it to the Christmas hamper this year, which will go to someone who maybe isn't the least of these, but is sometimes feeling like the least of these. And you take a small step against what the devil wants in this place. Second, sponsor child. He is ours. That's Jose Emanuel. He is from Ecuador. His birthday, by the way, was yesterday. So I I quickly emailed him yesterday and said, Happy birthday, Jose. Hope you're having a great day. We're praying for you. You can pray for Jose anytime. Or if you want to help with the cost of of sponsoring him, you could add a few bucks to your tithe. Just write it on that tithing envelope. There's a blank spot at the bottom. You can just go sponsor child and put chip in two bucks or five bucks or something added to your tithe that you want 
to go directly to the sponsor child. Faith promise. Faith promise. We help to, um, we help our our denomination with all the things that they do. And I was talking to a denominational leader not that long ago, actually, and we were kidding about the fact that I don't see him too often around here. And he laughed and he said, "Yeah." He said, "Here's the thing. I'm tied up with churches that are in trouble." <laughs> I'm tied up with, with, with churches that, that need my assistance that I, that I have to go and, and be with to help them whatever it is that is happening within their church. He said, so if you don't see me, it's probably a good thing. And I laughed and said, yeah, you're right, it is. But one way of ensuring that the denomination that can, can continue to do that with churches that are struggling or with people that are struggling or with ministries that are reaching out to those who are in need is through what the church, all of the money the denomination comes up with comes from churches like us. And we have, the the, the vehicle that we have for this is called Faith Promise. Nell and I add $20 a month to our tithe check just so that we can help, help the denomination do what they need to do with churches that are struggling and with people that are struggling. It's another way of just, just pushing back at what Satan wants. And this one we talk a lot about, but I don't think we can miss the importance of things like party the point or trunk or treat. For the ministry it is to the people in this community who need help. So at party at the point, we give away school supplies. We have a lot of fun out there. You're right. Give away hot dogs. And not everybody who comes is the least of these, but I can tell you, the least of these do show up. And they are very grateful for whatever help they can get from us. So, help out with party at the point. Or trunk or treat. Help us reach out to people who need help. Those who feel like they are alone. One more. It's not going to be up there. But I just want to mention this. You know, a lot of times, there is somebody that walks into this place who is hurting. And more than anything, they need someone to tell them, you matter. You are important. You are loved. And I believe that when they come into our midst, and by the way, they're here this morning, and it may not be who you think it is. It could be somebody, you know, that is a regular attender, but today they're just feeling a little down. They're not sure what to do, and they're, they're, and they're struggling, and they need somebody to come up and give them a hug and say, you know what, I love you. I believe that when they come into our midst, that God gives us a little kick and says, go and, go and say hi to Danny, Daniel. Never called him Danny before. Doesn't work, does it? No. I know he's big and scary, but you know, sometimes you just need somebody to come up and say, you know what, you play, you play an awesome bass guitar. I'm so glad that you're here. Every time we do this, we push back just a little at the evil that is around us. Because we are following what God has asked us to do. Just a little. The thing is, when a lot of us push just a little, it ends up being a whole lot. I believe that God has called his church to be the hope of the world. That means that we are supposed to be a bright spot. We're not supposed to be some sort of down or black experience. We are supposed to be the 
the place where people just need to come. I've often prayed that there would be a spiritual fire on our roof that would just bring people into us. That those who come here, that you would know, and every morning when you get up, that if you come here, you will be loved. You will be appreciated. That somebody, probably a lot more than just somebody, will be glad to see you. But I know from the emails I get that not everybody feels that way. And sometimes it's because we're shy. And we don't, we don't follow the pushings of God. We are supposed to make a difference. And even a small church like us can do it. If we will follow what God wants us to do. Let's pray one more time. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, help us to push back at the evil. We know that you do not tempt us. In fact, that you give us a way out of the temptations that we suffer. But God, help us to see those ways out. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to love even when we don't feel like we need to love help us do whatever we can to push back at the evil around us. And we will give all the praise and thanksgiving to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We invite you to stand if you'd like to. We sing a couple more songs. To the Lord with all of your heart, sing of the glory that's due to his name. Sing to the Lord with all of your soul, join all of heaven and earth to proclaim. You are the Lord, the Savior of all, God of creation, we praise you. We sing a song that awaken the dawn. God of creation, we praise you. Sing to the Lord with all of your mind, with understanding, give thanks to the King. Sing to the Lord with all of your strength, living our lives as a praise offering. You are the Lord, the Savior of all, God of creation, we praise you. We sing the songs that awaken the dawn, God of creation, we praise you. You are the Lord, the Savior of all, God of creation, we praise you. We sing the songs that awaken the dawn. God of creation, we praise you. Yes, we do. We praise you. It's what I've got to do. Praise. You are the Lord, the Savior of all. God of creation, we praise you. We sing the songs that awaken the dawn. 
God of creation, we praise you. You are the Lord, the Savior of all. God of creation, we praise you. We sing the songs that awaken the dawn. God of creation, we praise you. God of creation, we praise you. God of creation, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. God, we praise you with everything we have. We ask that you would be with us as we go into this world that is desperately needing your love. And God, we ask that you would allow us to be that love to them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We just want to remind you, if you do have tithes and offerings and you want to give, you can send them in an email transfer to vpcctreasure at outlook.com or drop them in the box here on your way out. But let's end with one more song. It's so good, I almost can't believe it. Far beyond what else could ever dream. The God who sent the galaxies in motion would descend and give his life for me. What could make perfection made for sinners? What forced the king to pay so great a cost? All my life, my heart will sing the answer. Only the
try My mind can't comprehend it It's alright to marvelous for what I can sing a million songs about it Barely scratch the surface of your work It's all my Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the, his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sin by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wait. So it is to be. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, and who is and who was and who, hit and who is to come, the Almighty. Go in peace. Amen. Thanks for sharing part of your Sunday with us. We hope to come back again next week, 11 o'clock right here at Vantage Point, and of course on Facebook. Until then, have a great week. Grace and peace be with you. Thank you, Jesus.